Thank you, Darren. I uh, actually wasn't aware there was such a thing as a warm New York City welcome uh, previously, so that's actually really cool. Uh, well, it is indeed a pleasure. It certainly makes me feel warm to be here uh, because of the great uh, affection and uh, respect I have for what is happening in this community or these communities that gather, uh, and especially the Center for Faith and Work. It's, I have learned so much by my connection uh, with you all, and it's a pleasure to see some faces I recognize and many I don't, and to get to share uh, the next uh, four or five hours with you. So I'm... I'm the problem with inviting an author to speak, of course, is that there's a lot to say, but I'm going to try to just be uh, relatively short, relatively provocative, and I hope helpful on a topic that it seems to me is of great importance and is notably absent in much Christian conversation, and that's the topic of power. Uh, when you consult the literature of Christian ethics, there are three topics that come up over and over as sort of central topics for Christian reflection. And they are, they, they were recently in the subtitle of Tim Keller's own book, Counterfeit, Counterfeit Gods. Uh, they are sex, money, and power. Sex, money, and power just come up over and over when you ask what are the perennial issues that uh, human beings have to deal with, but that especially Christians have to deal with. And yet it seems to me that at least in my experience of Christian conversation about the key issues that we have to wrestle with as we try to be faithful followers of Christ, that sex and money get a lot more attention. I don't know if you feel this way, but it has occurred to me that there are some basic reasons for this. One is uh, churches have to talk about money at least once a year because churches have budgets. And in fact, it's often this time of year. I don't know if that's the case at Redeemer, but in my church, we have Stewardship Sunday, which is really just a translation of uh, plan to give us your money Sunday. And so we, of course, want to talk about a Christian view of money to orient people towards their stewardship responsibilities. Uh, churches have to talk about sex because churches have youth groups. So... Uh, <clears throat> It's just, you can't avoid it. If you're going to do youth ministry, you've got to talk about sex. But for some reason, we rarely talk, at least directly, about power. Often, power is conspicuous by its absence in our conversations, and also by the ways we talk around power without actually uttering, shall we say, the P word. For example, we are much more comfortable and in fact, I've had some publishers tell me, you know, if you really want to reach people on power, you should call it leadership, right? So we're much more comfortable talking about leadership than about power. And of course, leadership is a, is a form of power, but it seems to me that first of all, this often is a bit of a euphemism uh, because it makes it sound unambiguously good. Who wouldn't want to be a leader, to have leaders, to see leadership cultivated, whereas I think the word power generates more complicated feelings in us. Uh, but there are, there are more problems with this uh, focus on leadership. One is that most of the literature on leadership, which fills, of course, whole you know, bookstores probably, or large sections of bookstores, actually takes for granted power and just asks how you can be more effective in using the power you have. Many books on leadership assume that you're already in a position of some amount of power, and the question is just how do you wield it uh, more effectively or even efficiently. And they rarely ask questions like, what does the possession of power do to us? Just having power, not even using it, but are there any ways in which just having power shapes us or misshapes us? Of course, the other problem is that uh, while leadership is a form of power, not all power comes from leadership. Uh, there's the power of being young in a youth-oriented culture, the power of being beautiful in a beauty-oriented culture, the power of creating something that people want to read or want to buy or listen to, none of which are really primarily about leadership, but all of which are tremendous sources of power. And finally, I think when we talk about power as leadership, we we tend to talk about the good that will come if we become more effective us users of it without attending to the fact that all uses of power have complex consequences, often unintended, uh, and even the best leadership sometimes goes awry or astray. This also allows a kind of um, 
self-deception, especially in the church among people who have power. And here's an example. A friend of mine was talking with a very celebrated American pastor. This is someone whose name, if you follow evangelical Christianity, you have probably heard this man's name. He pastors a, a large church. And my friend asked him, with the huge staff you have, the visibility you have, uh, all the opportunities you have to influence people, how do you handle the power you have? And the reply he got was, well, fortunately, in our church, that's not a problem because we don't have power in our church. We're all servant leaders. Well, yes, in a way, it, th there's some truth to what he says. I've been to his church. I, I know that I think this pastor was sincere in saying that uh, he aspires to be a servant leader. He tries to cultivate servant leaders in his church. He's a godly man. He's a man with a servant's heart. But he's also powerful. And you can't just say because we all aspire to be servant leaders that therefore there's no issue with power. Because I've also seen what happens when this man walks into a room that he wasn't in previously. And the way all the attention in the room shifts and conversation stops. And as people sometimes say, the oxygen sort of all starts flowing to one uh, person. And, and the, he has power. He is trying to use it as a servant leader, but he can't honestly say if he were to be helped to reflect, if he were here in the room right now being helped to reflect on this, he would have to realize, no, we do have power in our church. And how do we handle power in our church? There's power happening in this room right now, not uh, just uh, the fact that there's one person who has literal power uh, that I'm using to project my voice in ways that none of you get to, uh, but in the deference that you're showing by politely listening through my extended introduction and uh, in the fact that I got my list of credentials read while you didn't get your list of credentials read, right? Why is that? Uh, I told Darren to omit the credentials. He said, no, no, you, New Yorkers care about that stuff. <laughs> so, but there's also power happening between all of us. It's here. What do we do with it? Well, another alternative, rather than denying that it's present or not speaking of it, is to speak of it in the way that a friend of mine, who's a fairly powerful friend of mine, spoke of it or more accurately tweeted about it recently. Um, my friend Rob Bell, who tweets as Real Rob Bell, Rob is a, a pastor and performance artist of some note in our culture, uh, Rob tweeted the following in a two-part tweet a couple months ago now, maybe about a year ago about the early church. He said this, he tweeteth thus, to confess Jesus is Lord, in the early church this is, was to insist that peace does not come to earth through coercive violence, but through sacrificial love. That is still the question, is it not? Whose way, Jesus or Caesar? Power and might and domination or bloody, thirsty, hanging on a cross. And that was Rob's way of framing for his tweet audience uh, the, the issue of power. And of course we recognize there's a great deal of truth in it. Jesus did indeed come and offer a profoundly uh, different way, an alternative way to Caesar of power. While Caesar did project his power through crosses, Jesus showed his power by submitting to a cross. There is a dichotomy there. And Rob is calling attention to something very real and something that, it, not least of all, in the latter days of the American empire, we ought to reflect on. However, as I meditated on Rob's tweet, and I don't want to blame Rob too much for only fitting into 280 characters, uh, you know, what you can say. I mean, I, that's fair enough. But as I reflected on it, I found myself a little dissatisfied with the options I was being offered. And I started to ask myself, what if Rob, instead of tweeting about power, had been tweeting about sex? And he tweeted the following. Whose way? Jesus or Madonna? by which I mean the pop singer, not the mother of our Lord. Right? Uh, <laughs> or maybe we could update it by saying Lady Gaga or something like that, right? Sex and lust and promiscuity, or celibacy, chastity, and lifelong singleness. Whose way? Are you going to choose Jesus? Wouldn't you want to say, um, are there any other choices? Uh, 
available? <laughs> Are these my only two options? <laughs> we, would, we would feel uncomfortable by being presented that alternative, and we would want to say, no, no, I think, I mean, I understand Jesus was indeed celibate his whole life. He was lifelong single. He was fully faithful, fully sexual without sexual expression. Uh, and many Christians have, have been called to that life, and some of us are called to it now, yes, yes. But many of his disciples were not celibate in that way. We know that Peter traveled with his wife, according to Paul. Uh, we know that the early church met in households and family structures that included another expression of sexuality besides just uh, utter promiscuity or total abstinence. Uh, the Bible even offers us glimpses of what good uh, a good sexual life is in the in the context of uh, a, a beautiful, faithful marriage. And so we would say, that is not a fair choice. Or what if he had been tweeting about money? Uh, this is maybe a little more complicated, but, you know, and said, whose way? Jesus or mammon? Greed and exploitation and theft or poverty? Having only one linen garment to your name. And again, we'd say, well, I, I do see that Jesus did not have hardly any possessions, uh, called some people to give up their possessions. But wouldn't you quickly go on to say, but Barnabas had fields, some of which he sold. Ananias and Sapphira, when they hid their wealth, were told you could have kept it. Uh, it's the fact that you lied that caused God's judgment. Uh, so we have this sense, don't we, that there's a way to be faithful with money that is somehow in between the e extreme of, of poverty and the extreme of greed. And when we reflect on it a little more, we realize, going back to what Rob actually did tweet, that Caesar and Jesus are really names of two rival gods. Caesar, in his overreaching claim to be Lord, is just another name for the idolatry of power. And Rob is absolutely right to say that Jesus, who's willing to go to death on the cross to unmask every idol, is indeed the opposite of Caesar in that way, and you can't follow Jesus and Caesar in that way. And by the same token, mammon is the personification of money as an idol. And it's right to say, as Jesus said, you can't serve God and the idol called mammon. But this leaves open the question of whether there is a non-idolatrous way to be a sexual being, even to express one's sexuality, to be a person who, who is a steward of wealth, however much or little, and whether there's a non-idolatrous way to use power. So that is setting up what I want us to reflect on together. And one way I'd put the question is, is there any good news about power? In the discourse that Rob is sort of representing with, with his tweet, and again, I hate to blame Rob for two tweets, but he, it came up at a good time. And I thought, you know, this is the, the way a lot of people think about it. Power is all about bad news. And Jesus is all about the good news that you don't have to be part of that. But I want to ask the question, is there any good news about power? And there's three reasons I think we need to ask that question. First reason we need good news about power is we have it. We have power. What do I mean by power? Well, I've come to think that power is basically the ability to make something of the world. Power is the ability to make something of the world. And that phrase, which I've borrowed from Ken Myers, has, has two meanings. Uh, first of all, it can just mean to make a material change in the world. And in this sense, power is a quality of life. All life, by exercising its life power, makes something of the world. So the most basic forms of life take in, I suppose, uh, often carbon dioxide, turn it into oxygen and release it into the world, or sometimes do the reverse, hopefully in rough balance. Um, so all of life is making something of the world in the very basic sense that with the energy that we harvest from the sun and indirectly through the sun's uh, gift of life to us, uh, we make something. Uh, the world is different because we've been in it, and indeed we know when life has, en has ended when the ability to make something of the world has ended, where no more transformation is happening uh, because of the activity of that formerly living being. But making something of the world doesn't just mean making stuff, it can also mean making meaning. Because when you say, well, what do you make of that? Uh, I might say something confusing, you'll turn to your neighbor and say, well, what did you make of what he said? You don't really mean what stuff are you going to make, you mean, well, what, what did he mean by that? 
And so power is also the ability to invest the world with meaning, to say what the world means, which is why what I'm doing in this hour with you is an, is an attempt to exercise power. That is, I'm going to try to offer you some meanings. In fact, I'm doing it right now with the word power, right? I'm giving you a definition. I'm trying to invest that word with meaning in a way that you leave with a slightly different sense of what the world is about. And that's an act of power. It's actually a distinctly human act of power. We share with all of life this ability to make something of the world in the material sense. But only human beings seem to quest for meaning and to try to offer meanings and interpretations and to convince others of their meanings and interpretations. And when we do this successfully, we create what I called in my first book, Culture Making, cultural goods. Cultural goods are actual stuff that we make that is invested with meaning and that offers to the world a picture of what the world means. They can be very small. Um, the microphone that I'm using now is a cultural good. It sh it's shaped by a certain set of assumptions about what the world is like. The world has big halls that need to be filled. It generates a certain set of meanings, a certain way of talking. If I step away from the microphone, I have to begin to enunciate in a different way, which is possible. And those of you in the back can hear but I have to access a rhetorical register that's very distancing, isn't it? Whereas when I step in front of the microphone, I'm able to, it seems, be more myself than I can if I have to speak without a mic. And so the mic generates a sense of meaning. Uh, and we, we come to value uh, speakers and communicators who don't just deploy the rhetorical forms that worked in an era before amplification, but actually work uh, in more intimate ways now. Now, I would guess that all of us have exercised power in this way. That is, all of us have brought some little thing into the world that other people took up and said, oh yes, that adds something to the world. It may have been very small. It, it may not have influenced a lot of people. But my guess is that you have tasted this kind of power. That is, you've made something of the world uh, in your life. And what I'd actually like you to do is think about this question. When was a time that you successfully brought something into the world that other people appreciated? Um, this could be a very small thing. My nine-year-old, uh, a few months ago, baked me the first birthday cake that she ever baked for me, an apple cake. And it came out wonderfully, and the family consumed it with great uh, delight and delectation. And that was Amy's first kind of all-on-her-own cake. She proposed this cultural good of a cake. It had meaning attached to it. It's Daddy's birthday. I want to celebrate Daddy, right? She successfully proposed a cultural good, and she had the power to do it. Uh, and we now grant her the power to bake a lot. Uh, we actually love it when our 10-year-old daughter bakes. So when was a time, maybe an early time, when you successfully proposed a new cultural good? What was it like to do that? What, how did it feel to do that? And, and what happened after you did that? I'd actually like you to find a neighbor and think out loud about this. When is a time when you've tasted this kind of power? Maybe at a very simple level, uh, or may, maybe that's what you'll choose to share, but share one time when you successfully created something that other people said, hey, that's... That's pretty good. So would you find a neighbor, introduce yourselves if you don't know each other, and just for like two or three minutes, uh, share those stories with each other. Can a couple of people share what came to mind as an, a time when you proposed a, a new cultural good and made something of the world? Don't be too shy. Yeah. An instructional metaphor. Um, and. Can you be a little more uh, concrete? <laughs> Perfect. So teaching martial arts, coming up with new ways to sort of give people a picture of what they're being asked to do. The students catch on. The, the metaphors catch on. Other teachers start using it. Um, and can I just quickly ask, uh, what was that like? Or what did that feel like uh, when you realized this is catching on? Uh, this is, as a teenager, a huge affirmation. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to hear from a couple other people, but wonderful. So the, that early sense of, wow, I can actually add something here that was missing before that makes it possible for people to, to do this, in this case, martial arts better. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so you were allowed to plan the family vacation. Yes, you were granted power, right? And what was that like? Where did you take your family? 
It sounds like you were very you were very responsible with your power. Actually, Hearst Castle, very high, Yosemite, you know, appropriate, and budget conscious. Yeah. So that experience of being given some space to offer something, and the family says, "Okay, we'll do that." Maybe one more example, just to yes. So you're on a in, part of a panel talking about what it's like to create in the context of a, of a difficult economic environment. Uh, and in that context, you're able to offer some ideas. Often the other panelists pick it up, people respond, and that's another example of, of uh, being granted some power and then using it to offer something. And I suspect all of us were able to think of things like this. We have power. Uh, we've been granted power. People have asked us to do these things often. Uh, our parents or the organizers of conferences or our fellow teachers. I'm going to switch back to this mic. I'm making life hard for the sound guy today. So, um, uh, This is part of the human experience, and this is power. And see, it doesn't fit very neatly into that dichotomy of uh, total abandonment or uh, domination. None of the examples that at least these folks shared, probably the rest of you shared examples when you just sort of uh, pillaged and destroyed, but um, you know, at least the examples people were willing to share were of creativity, of addition, of bringing something new into the world, not simply uh, controlling or dominating. So the first reason that I think we need to end up with some way to talk about the good news about power is that we have power, and all of us will leave here and continue to exercise power. Uh, even if it's just as simple as where are we having lunch or where are we having dinner, uh, we will all be exercising it. As long as we're alive, in some way, we'll be exercising power. Second reason we need good, ne good news about it is that we cannot get rid of power. And in this way, power is interestingly different from sex and money. Because you can give away all your money. That is theoretically possible, and Jesus called at least one young man to do that. Uh, and I know more or less to the dollar, thanks to Quicken, how much money I have, and I could get rid of every dollar. I could find a way to divest myself of my money. Of course it's possible uh, to choose not to have sex. Uh, and people do that, not in New York, but in other places, they, they do. Um, so it is, it's possible, fully possible, Jesus did it to be a human being without expressing one's sexuality, right? But you can't be alive without making something of the world. And you can't be in relationships without being in this constant creative process of, well, what do we do next? How do we do it? What are we going to create? Even if it's as simple as what are we having for dinner, there's a, a, some choices being made about what we make of the world. You cannot get rid of at least all your power until the moment when all of us will divest ourselves of all our power, when we will lie down and never again uh, in this world rise up. But interestingly, even when Jesus was bloody, thirsty, hanging on a cross, what, what happens, but he finds himself in this conversation with these two guys who are crucified with him as they are all breathing their last breaths. And they end up in this conversation about, first of all, whether Jesus deserves to be there like the two thieves. And then one says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. What is that? If not a profound, faithful act of meaning making at this moment that seems to be the end of all their lives. And Jesus saying, no, actually, you are right to ask for entry into my kingdom. I have the ability to grant entry into my kingdom. And even as we gasp on the cross, I exercise my power to bless you and tell you that because of your repentance and your faith, you are going to join me uh, when my true power is unveiled. And this is true for us, too in that even when we are breathing our last breath and our earthly power is expiring, we will, if we uh, have put our trust in Christ, we will be heirs of a kingdom. Paul says, don't you know we're going to judge nations? We are actually just in waiting for much more power than we'll ever have uh, in this current uh, regime. And we anticipate a kingdom where we will reign with Christ so that even we... Uh, cannot give up power even on our deathbed. So we need good news about power because we can't get rid of it. Perhaps we could think that the only faithful thing to do with money would be to give it away and we could, or to be entirely abstinent and we could, but we can't abstain from power. We, there must be a good way to use power. 
Uh, the third reason we need good news about power is that there's a lot of bad news about power. And I could have asked you to share a time when you tried to propose something and no one did take you up on it. When you tried to create something and your creation was squashed. Uh, I talk with artists who say most people stop drawing in third grade, right? <laughs> when a teacher says you can't draw. And so indeed, they stop drawing. We've also had people use their power against us. We've seen entrenched systems of power used against us. And anyone in this room uh, could tell a story that would be much harder to tell than the ones we told about the successful use of power. Indeed, it seems to me that the only real news about power would be good news. Because the bad truth about power is not news. Uh, do you ever just feel like you get tired of opening up the quote-unquote news and reading basically the same story every day, which is people with power abuse it. People without power are excluded from it. I mean, we know the bad news about power. The bad news about power is all around us. Is there any, anything good to say about power? That would be news. That would be news. So, I happen to believe there is, and it comes from the very first page of the Bible. Let me just read a few of these verses from Genesis 1. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, and the waters swarmed with them, after each after its kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And let Andy lose his place on his iPhone. Here we are. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And God said, Let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And God, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living, thring, every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. This story was not written in a vacuum. This creation story was written in a world full of creation stories, and in those competing or surrounding creation stories in the ancient Near East, the essential theme of creation was conflict. The one that we have the best access to is the Enuma Elish, uh, this ancient Babylonian creation story that's certainly contemporary with the, the writing of, uh, of the Genesis story. And in the Enuma Elish, the world is created because uh, Marduk uh, slays Tiamat, the, the uh, goddess of chaos, and fillets her, and the upper fillet becomes the heavens and the lower fillet becomes the earth. The world begins with a murder. And the world, we all walk around in this myth on the sort of the, the filleted half of the dragon that was slain by Marduk. And then Marduk gets in a conversation with the gods and they say, well, this world is all very fine, but there is no one to worship us. And the, god, the gods start to war against one another, seeking worship. And they commission Marduk to create human beings to worship the gods so that they won't uh, all slay one another in their divine contest for worship. Human beings exist because of divine conflict that Marduk solves by providing uh, human worshipers. And in that context comes the story that begins not with conflict, but with abundance and goodness. I love the word that the American Standard Version uses, swarms, or that other, other versions translate teeming, the earth teeming with creatures. And God sees all this abundance just as pure goodness, the fruitfulness of the world, the world being commanded to be fruitful. Uh, and then God finally brings into this world his own image bearers, and what does he tell them to do? Well, it's interesting how much there is about power in this story. 
God, uh, first of all, makes them in his image. Well, in the ancient Near East, that had the connotation of the image of a ruler. The, the one who bore the ruler's image, usually with little coins or other representations, was the one who had the ability to actually carry out the ruler's intentions at the edge of his dominion. Uh, there's also, of course, this picture of partnership, of, of male and female working together uh, in the use of power rather than simply competing for the use of power. There's the command to be abundant and fruitful. Human beings are to uh, spread out, fill the earth with abundance. But then there are some words that we find more difficult, dominion and subduing. So I want to try to ask, how is there good news in the dominion and the subduing parts of Genesis? Well, first of all, it occurs to me, as I have meditated on this passage, that dominion for the Hebrews could not possibly have meant coercion or control. Because what are they supposed to have dominion over? Well, the sea monsters, you know, Leviathan, behemoth, uh, these creatures that are, operate kind of on the edges of the known world. What would it mean to have dominion over Leviathan? No way. Uh, even over the fish, you know, the Hebrew people did not really like the ocean. Uh, Hebrew people are not a seafaring people. And yet, here's the, the Hebrew Bible saying, you are going to have dominion over all the teams in the seas. What would it mean to have dominion over the birds of the air? When you don't, when you, you know, maybe every once in a while a bow and arrow can bring down one. It can't possibly mean, can it, the kind of control that with modern forms of technology we actually can exercise over the world and sometimes do to the great uh, despoilment of the world. So what did the writer mean by dominion? Well, I think it means what we actually see in Genesis. For example, discovery. Dominion as discovery, that is, Adam having all the creatures in Genesis 2 brought before him and naming them one by one. Dominion as celebration, the, the Lord of this whole domain steps back from his creation and just celebrates it. God saw that it was good. So that dominion means to celebrate what God has made, to do what no other creature in the world does, which is stop and contemplate how good it is. Uh, I watch squirrels in my backyard for, you know, well, many minutes at a time, just enjoying the squirrels. The squirrels never watch each other and say, isn't it great to be a squirrel? But I watch the squirrels, and I think it's great to be a squirrel. That's something only human beings do. That's exactly what the creator does. That's actually exercising dominion when I celebrate the world. And then cultivation. Human beings are put in the world to till it and to keep it, to be part of this world that's good for food and beautiful to the eyes and creativity to make more of the world than was there before. So it seems to me that we need to understand the dominion that human beings are given in the way that the original readers could have understood it, which is not as control, not as making the world do what we want it to do, but what God in fact does, which is create space for fruitfulness, abundance, and then discovering and celebrating what comes of that. You know, I think about this uh, just to give an example of how this has happened recently in New York. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of culture that arguably in the history of New York was uh, an act of more coercion and control. It was kind of uh, forcing something into New York, uh, into the natural landscape of New York. It was this rail line that ran down through lower Manhattan, right? And cut off one half of Chelsea and those other neighborhoods from the other. And I remember it as a, uh, you know, a younger person visiting New York is this really ugly part of Manhattan. Well, of course, what have people done in the past couple of years exercising dominion over that part of this island? Well, they created this unbelievable thing called the High Line that has reclaimed this part of the world that was just sort of brutal industrial fact and turned it into something of beauty. It seems to me that that's an example of dominion of taking something even broken and making it better. Now, of course, we know there's more to this creation story than just the good news. The bad news is that the human beings placed by God in his world as his image bearers become dissatisfied with that role. And they, they listen to this creature, the serpent, who tries to convince them that the power that they've seen at work in the world, this power of abundance and teeming and fruitfulness, discovery, celebration, is not true power. The serpent tells them this, uh, God knows that uh, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you will be like God. 
knowing good and evil. And with those words, the serpent tempts them to distance themselves from their creator and to actually try to take on the task of self-creation. I find the serpent's words very curious because they are already like God. What does he say? God is, he implies, God is afraid that you will be like God if you eat that fruit. But the man and the woman are made in the image of God. God made them after his likeness. It's already the case that they're like God. So what is the serpent insinuating? He's insinuating that God will be threatened if you are like God, which of course is not true. The true God is not threatened by his image bearers being in the world, but the serpent is the voice of false gods, and false gods cannot bear competition. False gods have a kind of zero-sum assumption about the world. If I get more glory and being, you get less. For me to be more, you must diminish. For me to be everything, you, bu- you must be nothing. And this, the genius of the serpent is to suggest to the man and woman, you know the power that God has? He's very threatened if anyone else attains to that power. And so you need to uh, sort of play this competitive game with your own creator. Uh, you need to become a God like that God. But the God that he's describing is not, in fact, the God of the garden, the God of this teeming, abundant world who delights in nothing more than having more power appear in the world uh, because of his own creativity. Here's how a modern channeler of the serpent's voice put it. My idea is that every specific body strives to become master over all space and to extend its force and to thrust back all that resists its extension. But it continually encounters similar efforts on the part of other bodies and ends by coming to an arrangement or union with those of them that are sufficiently related to it. Thus, they then conspire together for power, and the process goes on. That, of course, is Friedrich Nietzsche in his book, The Will to Power. Every specific body Nietzsche says, tries to master space, tries to extend itself, tries to take over, and it tries to thrust back every other body. And since we find ourselves in a room like this and we can't all thrust back every other body, no one of us can dominate the whole room, we form sort of convenient alliances to dominate. It's the serpent. It's this idea that power is competition, that power cannot bear abundance, that power has to... um, to gather to itself all being, all glory, all ability, and that if I have more of that, that necessarily means you have less, and if you have more, I must have less. But I think we need to ask Nietzsche and the serpent this question. Why do you think that's the truth about the world? Because what Nietzsche is saying is the truth about the world is in the Enuma Elish. It's all conflict. And when it looks like creativity, it's actually just conflict. This is also the move of Nietzsche's uh, close disciple, Michel Foucault. When you see people appearing to do creative things, good things in the world, it's actually covertly the expression of the will to power. But I think we need to ask, is that really true? Or might we not respond to Friedrich Nietzsche this way? I'm going to paraphrase him. All true being strives to create room for more being, to expend its power in the creation of more flourishing environments for variety in life, and to thrust back the chaos that limits true being. In doing so, true being creates other bodies and invites them into mutual creation and tending of the world, building relationships where there was estrangement and alienation, thus cooperating together in creating more power for more creativity, more creation, and the process goes on. It seems to me that's the story of Genesis, that God's power, rather than excluding power, actually creates more power. As God creates, he creates power. And could that be our story as well? I'll tell you a story. We'll look at a painting I'll say one more thing, we'll sing, and then we'll be done. It'll only take uh, 45 more minutes. No, it'll be short. A year ago, I started taking uh, lessons on the cello. 
my wife plays violin, my daughter plays violin, my son plays viola. So we have three quarters of a string quartet. So if dad would just get his act together, we could play Ina Kleinox music or whatever. So a year ago, I walked down to Dane Anderson's house. He lives about two blocks away from me. I said, Dane, I'd like to learn the cello. Dane is a quite accomplished cellist, cellist and violin maker. He said, well, are you willing to practice? <laughs> I said, yes, I will practice. I've never touched a string instrument, but I am a musician, and I'll, I really will work at this, and I'll pay you whatever you ask. And he said, all right, so I prevailed. So for a year now, I've been trundling with my cello down to Dane Anderson's house every Thursday morning. It's quite an extraordinary experience as a 42-year-old to be a total beginner. Uh, I'll be playing something and it'll sound horrible. And I think this other guy who's about my age is being so gracious by listening to me, to, listening to me do abysmally what he does beautifully. And then he'll come around behind me and he'll say, oh, that's not right, your hand position's all wrong. So he'll grab my hand and I'll think, this is so odd. A, a fellow man is holding my hand, repositioning it. I feel like I'm about nine years old again. I feel so vulnerable. And yet gradually, as he works with me, I'm, I'm gradually beginning to make noises that do not cause cats to run uh, you know, into their homes and parents to take their children off the streets and, and so forth. What's happening in those lessons? Well, think first of all about what's happening with, with the money between us. Uh, every week I pay Dane $50, so pretty good. Probably not New York prices, but... Uh, uh, so at the end of my lesson, I hand him $50. I have 50 fewer dollars, and he has 50 more dollars, right? So that is a zero-sum relationship. However, at the end of every lesson, I have a little more power to play the cello. And I don't think Dane has any less power to play the cello. In fact, any of you who have been teachers know, in the course of teaching something, you learn it better. He probably has a little more power, power to play the cello himself. So the total amount of power to play the cello in Swarthmore increases every Thursday morning. Even though the total amount of money in our little microeconomic system stays the same. It seems to me the test of power is whether it creates more power. True power creates flourishing, which is to say, true power creates more power. And so you can ask this question as you walk out of here in, in a little bit. Uh, how did Andy use his power? Well, there's a very simple way to tell in a way. Do I leave, do, do you leave, that is, thinking about this talk, do you leave thinking, I am I feel a little more human than I did when I came. Did Andy use his way in such a way, use his power in such a way that, that I feel more human? Or, as sometimes happens when people use their power to speak, their power of celebrity, their power of intellect, that you leave just feeling less, feeling smaller, feeling diminished, and only feeling like one person in the room became more human, more celebrated, more capable. The test of power is whether it creates more power. And that leads us to the picture that you were handed, hopefully, uh, as you came in. Um, and if you don't have it, maybe you can raise your hand and someone will bring it to you. It's this image. There are a couple hands towards the back. So this painting is by Henry Tanner. Henry Tanner uh, flourished uh, around the turn of the 20th century, the late 19th century, early 20th century. And this painting is called The Banjo Lesson. Uh, and if someone has a hand up near you and no one's providing them a card, maybe you can share with them, share your power with them. And what I'd like you to do is just take uh, about two minutes to look at this painting and to ask yourself, uh, of course you can observe whatever you like about it, but in particular to ask, what does this painting have to say to me, to us, about power? So that's your assignment for the next uh, two minutes, just by yourself, is to... Spend a little time with this painting, with this small reproduction, uh, asking, what do I learn from this painting about power? So I'm going to give you some time just in silence to contemplate this painting right now. All right. Uh, well, I'd actually like to hear what you saw. So again, I have to ask you to speak loudly, uh, and I'll repeat what you say so we all can benefit from it. But let's just begin very broadly. Uh, anything that you notice, whether it's directly about power or not, uh, what did you find 
intriguing, surprising, compelling, et cetera, about this uh, painting. Yes? The older man is so respectively, uh, respectfully contemplating and listening, the angle of his head that indicates this careful attention to what the boy's doing on the banjo. Yes, beautifully put, thank you. Yes. There, there's love and gentleness in the, the posture, in the sort of framing of the, the whole room in a way. Yes, absolutely. I think that's very right. Yes. The man is changing the boy's life. He is. He's, we don't know whether this is the first banjo lesson or maybe the fifth banjo lesson. It's pretty early on, I, I sense. Uh, and this boy is having his, his world opened up. There's a new kind of flourishing entering into his life thanks to the gift that, I don't know, maybe it's his grandfather. I often tend to think of it as grandfather and grandson, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, in red, back there, yes. It's a very, that's right. So this is not, a, not presented as a typical place of power. The setting is very humble. Uh, the settings are very simple. Uh, and yet, there's, there's real power being created here. Uh, it doesn't just happen in gilded halls. It's happening in this little home. Yes. The boy is, uh, I love your word, he's snuggled into the arms of his grandfather. There's this gentle, safe intimacy uh, that allows him to experiment and explore, uh, and, and he welcomes this transfer of power. There's no sense here of, uh, you know, time for your banjo lesson. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's, there's a kind of a gentleness and safety about it that's making room for creativity. Yes. Yeah, so the little boy is uh, clearly plucking or strumming, but the grandfather is definitely helping out on the fretboard there. So there's this use of power to, to sort of uh, make it appropriately possible for the child to grow in what he can do, rather than just handing him the banjo and saying, go play with it. The grandfather has decided, no, I'm going to spend the time to actually gradually create capacity here. It's a very different thing from just handing him a banjo or, or just sending him off for a lesson maybe with a, a distant teacher. Yes. So you're calling attention, and uh, I'll, I'll try to accurately summarize what you said, to the fact that it's not just about these two individuals, but this painting is giving us a whole setting, and the setting is one of, of tremendous warmth. Uh, but also you've picked up on something that painters pick up on very quickly when they look at Tanner, which is his masterful use of light. And the fact that there are maybe two sources of light in this painting, uh, one from the fireplace, one perhaps from a window, that create this sense of uh, perhaps divine light kind of streaming in on this encounter. Uh, it, I think Tanner, who was a Christian, uh, is definitely trying to say there's something transcendent going on here. It's not just one more lesson. Yeah, maybe a few more comments. Yes. There's an exchange of, of joy, an exchange of joy. Yes. It's not like uh, the grandfather's thinking, oh, my grandson's getting better and better. I'm, you know, uh, you know there's, there's no sense of resentment. There's no sense of Nietzschean conflict here. There's the sense of more. I don't think there's anything Nietzschean <laughs> in this painting. Uh, more joy is being created for both of them. And both are needed. The grandfather needs the grandson as much as the grandson needs the grandfather in a way. Yeah. Uh, yes. He voluntarily relinquishes his power to play the banjo, but also he restrains his strength in a way. This is a, it's a, by the way, in a culture that desperately needs images of masculinity, our, our American culture, this is such a beautiful image of masculinity, I think. Because this is a strong, capable man, musically capable, but capable in other ways. And yet he's sort of bracketing that strength to make room for the growing strength of, of, of the young boy, uh, rather than just dominating with his strength. Yeah, that's beautifully put. Uh, one last comment, yes, yes. Very important point and very appropriate to lead us to that point, which is that we can't neglect the wider context in which this picture takes place. Both the encounter described in the picture, but also the painting of, of this image itself. Uh, within the world of the painting, we have a, an older African-American man in, uh, at the turn of the 19th century, or 19th to 20th centuries. And so we know that this man has experienced the worst that power can do. Um, has been part of a terrible, uh, a story of terrible abuse of power. That is, of course, also true of Henry Tanner. 
Henry Tanner was a, of African descent. His father uh, was first a teacher and then eventually a, a minister and bishop in the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, his mother uh, escaped from the South through the Underground Railroad, uh, and they had their son Henry, who was always interested in art. They did their best to discourage him, but <laughs> he was so talented that he ended up at the Philadelphia Academy uh, studying with Thomas Eakins, the great 19th century painter of figures and, and portraits. And, and in fact, Eakins painted Tanner's own portrait. Uh, and Tanner paints this, I think, not by accident, paints a banjo lesson. To understand the significance of the subject, you have to understand what the banjo meant in the dominant culture of the 19th century. It was the instrument of minstrelsy. It was the instrument by which uh, the dominant culture exploited black culture for entertainment and pleasure. It was quite a Nietzschean uh, image, actually, the banjo. Uh, the banjo was sort of the symbol of happy-go-lucky uh, black life that never uh, confronted or um, challenged, the, was never seen as confronting or challenging the dominant culture. And if you had said banjo, to most Americans in 1893, when Tanner began work on this painting, they would have thought of a caricature. They would have thought of a, a black, perhaps a blackface performer or a minstrel performer. Uh, what they would not have thought of is what Tanner painted, which is this rich, warm, human interaction. So what is Tanner doing? By choosing to paint a banjo lesson, he's saying, I am going to reclaim that image that image that's been broken by power, I'm going to show you how true power was conveyed in the black community through the passing on from generation to generation of these gifts. And to show you human beings in a dignified environment, in a full human environment, flourishing as human beings. And I'm going to display that in Philadelphia, eventually in the French salons. Uh, Tanner became the first African-American artist to be admitted to the French salons and went on to paint many images that reframed power. What was he doing? You know, if there was anyone who could have thought the world is zero sum, it was Henry Tanner. Uh, you know, some people have power, some don't. Power is dominance. Power is the extension of oneself to control others. And yet what he did is he created into that. He offered something into that that was so compelling that first of all, it sustained uh, an, an, a self-image for black Americans. In the, in the middle of the 20th century, this image would have been in many, many middle class black homes. In fact, many, some of you who are of African descent, I know you've seen this painting before, maybe in your grandmother's home or your aunt's home, because this image spread all around the country as a way to say, this is humanity. This is creativity. This is true power. And it was a, an offering that eventually overcame those caricatures of the banjo, so that now this is a much more famous image of a banjo player than any of the caricatures that circulated in the 19th century. So, a final thought, and then we'll pray, and then you can ask a few questions. What would it look like for us to restore the image of power where we work? Where have people played false gods? Where have we colluded in playing false gods who think that power cannot be shared, that power can't create more power? How have false gods been played in the world of art, in the world of business, in the world of education, and how could we play a different kind of power there? Uh, ultimately, I don't think we will be able to have this kind of power, the original good power that created the world, without worship, because worship is the only remedy for people who have begun to play false gods. The only hope for those of us who have been caught up in this Nietzschean idea that divinity excludes, that being is jealous of being, is to die to those foolish games of zero-sum power and rise in the power of God's abundant life. Uh, Paul has this marvelous description in Ephesians where he exceeds the available dimensions when he talks about the length, the breadth, the height, and the width, that's four <laughs> dimensions of the love of God. 
this multi-dimensional creative love in which there is space for every being to flourish and be what it was meant to be. The only way we will get there is to empty ourselves in worship and allow the spirit of Jesus who emptied himself to fill us.